Um, when you think of the greatest leaders in, in history, they typically emerge during the toughest times. Um, they, and now we are in the toughest times. We are looking for leadership. And that's what I would hope is that the young people coming in will realize, speak up. Um, say what you need as an employee. And then when you become a leader yourself, really take care of those in your charge. That it really is about relationships. People will do much when they know that you care about them. Okay. Um, hello and welcome to another episode of the People Hum interview series. Uh, I'm your host, Nayan Jadeja at People Hum. Just a quick introduction of People Hum. Uh, it is an end to end, one view, integrated human capital management automation platform. The winner of the 2019 Global Cody Award for HCM that is specifically built and crafted for employee experiences and the future of work with AI and automation technologies. Uh, we run the People Hum blog and a video channel specifically targeting leaders and young leaders uh, through our Leaders Hum series. And it is indeed a great pleasure for me to introduce Adrian Gostick, uh, a world-renowned author, speaker, and a leadership guru. Uh, Adrian is a global expert on organizational culture and the author of some of the top New York Times and Wall Street Journal bestsellers like The Carrot Principle, All In, and Leading with Gratitude. His books have been translated into over 30 languages and have sold more than one and a half million copies worldwide. He's often quoted in the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, Fast Company, NYT, and also has been featured on NBC's Today Show and CNN. Uh, Adrian is a founding partner of The Culture Works, a global consultancy that's focused on helping organizations building high performance work cultures. He's also a member of the Marshall Goldsmith 100 Coaches Project. Wow, welcome Adrian. It's a pleasure <laughs> to have you. Thank you, Nayan. Nice to be here. Yeah. So um, maybe you could start with, I mean, I found it interesting. I was, um, you know, kind of browsing through the culture works and maybe you could walk our audience through kind of your journey and how you ended up in creating the culture works. Yes, about uh, 20 years ago or so, Chester Elton, my co-author and I, we wrote our first book. Um, we were really focused in at that point on employee recognition, uh, how you help employees feel appreciated and valued at work. Our work began to grow. We began to study teams and what made the greatest teams. We, we then began to work on culture and really figuring out what, what set great organizational cultures apart around the world. What were those those little things that great cultures did to really engage their people, energize them, and to really enable their workers. And about 10 years ago, Chester and I, we formed our own company called The Culture Works. And we began um, uh, as consultants, working with a team of consultants to help these organizations. And we have evolved over the years to writing books like you mentioned, All In, on great cultures featuring large research studies that includes countries around the world, including India, and really showing the difference, differences between uh, what engages somebody in Bangalore versus what engages somebody in Beijing or Boise, Idaho in the United States. We wanted to really understand worldwide what were those drivers of engagement. Um, lately, our work has included um, books like uh, Leading with Gratitude, which you also mentioned, and The Best Team Wins. So we really have several focuses in our practice. It's helping organizational cultures, it's helping build stronger teams, and employee engagement, and how leaders can really get their people more engaged and passionate about their work. Mm -hmm. So I would be curious, um, you know, whenever you, you hear leaders and CEOs talk, um, they always say, oh, the, you know, our people are the most important, right? I mean, and, and that's, that's uh, what everybody says. 
but there are very few that are actually able to kind of you know create uh, the type of cultures where their employees can thrive. In your opinion, are there certain characteristics that make for you know organizations to be successful in kind of implementing a culture that you know enables that? Or what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, it's a great question because you're right. We we every organization we've ever gone into, they have told us uh, our people are our most important asset. And yet they do so many things that proves otherwise. So what we find is there are, in our research, we've identified seven key steps. And this is what we uh, identify in our book, All In. Given seven key steps that those great organizations really do differently, that really set them apart. Um, the first is they're brutally honest about their, uh, their, their competitive environment and they really do help people understand their burning platform, their employees. Why do we have to do the things we're doing, especially younger employees? You know that coming into the workplace, they want to know why. Well, well why, Nyan, why are you telling me to do it this way? Why do I have to? And, and back in our day, we just did what we were told. But younger employees, they want to know the why. So great com cultures, especially nowadays, they provide a very clear burning platform. Here's why we have to do this. Here's our mission, here's our values. Other ideas within the scope include, for instance, becoming more agile than we've ever been before. Uh, you know, 10, 20 years ago, it didn't, didn't matter as much to be as agile. And yet we all know right now we're being thrown new ways of working. Uh, look at this pandemic and, and the companies that have been able to, to react are those that were more agile before this began. Uh, many very, you know, very traditional organizations have been frozen in place because they don't know how to react because they weren't nimble before this. Um, other ideas in the seven include ideas like um, partnering with your talent, treating your people like partners in the business to get their best ideas out. And that also means treating them like partners in helping them develop their careers, caring about what they care about so they care about what you care about. So with all this, we've identified some areas that we know this is low hanging fruit, that if we go into an organization, we can give them these options to improve. And typically a leader like yourself will say, of those seven, I know this one, this one, and this one, we're not very good at. We need to focus in on those. Got you. Um... Just to follow up uh, again, and this is probably based on, you know, personal experience, what happens in the software world and the technology world is, um, you know, most organizations don't have a kind of a well laid out, you know, a, either a career growth or a career plan, right? And so inevitably you kind of take, you know, your best software person and when he comes in and says, so where do I go? And you say, okay, here, you, you've got to become the manager or the leader, right? With very little in terms of, I mean, he's gone through his whole education, kind of learning computer software and, you know, hardware and stuff. And then suddenly the person who's the best at interacting with the computers and, you know, making software work has to figure out how to, you know, get teams motivated and get people to work together. Uh, are you seeing uh, that across industries? What do you think organizations are doing well or not doing well to help these, you know, young leaders as they kind of embark on this journey? Another, another very astute observation, uh, but you're exactly right. They, what we find is, um, you know, Paul is the best programmer, so let's make him the manager. Well, that, that is absolutely the wrong way to think. What we should be looking for is the person who is best able to, to, to inspire others, to organize others, and to help develop others. And in many cases, Paul, your amazing programmer, may be so self-absorbed, that's what's made him a wonderful programmer. Um, and so what we have to do is really rethink this idea of leadership, mm -hmm. is that this is not the best person in the department gets promoted. They may have the most expertise, it's true, 
but they also may be terrifically uh, unqualified or unmotivated to lead others. In fact, this is, uh, Chester and I, we have an executive coaching practice, so we do a lot of executive coaching. In fact, um, IT firms is our specialty. Mm -hmm. And so this is the, the person you're describing is the person we work with the most. Um, we try, we take these, uh, these newly minted managers, uh, many of whom have never led before, and we work with them. Usually it's over a year or in some cases longer. And mm -hmm. we're, we're teaching them the, the basics of leadership. We're teaching them how to, how to inspire a team, how to deal with problem employees, because in many cases, these people have been promoted out of the group and then there's some resentments or there's some issues going on there. And so one of the things that we really have to do is every person is different. I can't paint with a broad brush to say every manager who is promoted has this problem or this problem. What we typically find is this is a, as we as I would work individually with an, with a leader, uh, especially a new and new manager, we'll typically find out what, their their challenges are it may be communicating effectively you know maybe they kind of try, try to keep all their information close to their vest and they can't anymore maybe they're not very good at getting others opinions uh, maybe they're a little autocratic and they're they're demanding and it's 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 draining on their people maybe they're not very good at, at thanking their people or being grateful so typically it's it's very personal what they need to work on but what we find is just as they, they worked on their, their programming skills coming up, this is something that has to become a new science to them, learning how to lead. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I can't agree more, sir. Uh, I think, um, you know, throughout your work in terms of the books and a, a lot of what you talk about, you, you do talk a lot about employee engagement. Uh, have you seen that change over the years? And uh, especially given the times that we are in, right? Uh, we're trying to work through the pandemic. Obviously, this has to be one of the kind of top priorities, if you may, for companies. Uh, what are you seeing out there? And it's one of these interesting things uh, is that... Uh, we have known since about 1990 is when this term employee engagement started coming up. By about, by about 20 years ago, we'd all heard this term employee engagement in leadership. And yet we have known about it for, for now at least two decades. And employee engagement scores around the world just keep going down. Why is that? What other management um, philosophy do we all know about? Um, and, 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 know very little about how to impact it. And so that's what our work has really been um, studying. And a couple of things we've found. First off is that we've, we've tended to look at employee engagement from a macro perspective. When we go into an organization, we want to treat everybody the same and say, okay, so if we give everybody this, this, and this, everybody's going to be more engaged. And what we found is it just doesn't work. Um, employee engagement is a very individual thing. What engages me is going to be very different, Niam, than what engages you, than what engages my co-author, Chester. Chester is very much driven by ideas like friendship and teamwork and service. My top motivators are ideas like creativity, autonomy, family. So we're very different. And if I'm a manager managing me versus Chester, I'm going to manage us in very, very different ways. Um, the rules, of course, apply to everybody, as we know in HR. But how I manage you is going to be very different. The problem is, in many cases, we're stuck in this old mindset of, I want to treat everybody the same because that's fair. It's, it's a terrible way to manage. So the first aha that we've had in all this research we have done, and a million employees worldwide surveyed now, is that engagement will only be impacted when we begin managing people one by one figuring out what your drivers are and managing to that. I know it sounds like a lot more work and it is, but the results are exponential. You know, the other idea is that engagement alone is this floating idea. So think about it like a, a hamster spinning on a wheel. I'm engaged, great, but I've got nowhere to go. And eventually what happens is the wheel slows down and the hamster gets bored. Um, and that's engagement without a couple of accelerators that we've found in our research. 
to accelerate engagement, you have to have this idea we call enablement. That means I'm supported. So I have the right training, the right tools and equipment at my disposal. I am empowered, but that's just part of it. Enablement means that I'm out of the wheel and I can just run. And you as a manager have to help me understand how I am enabled in my work and support it. And the other idea that, that accelerates engagement is this idea we call energy or being engaged or energized, I should say. Energy, it keeps me going. And there's a very strong correlation in our research between energy levels and ideas like well, work-life balance, especially for younger employees. Their families, their tribes, their friends are just as important as their work, but also purpose. Why am I doing what am I doing? Um, are you giving me a noble purpose as we come into work every day? You get those accelerators going and we find engagement can be impacted, especially as we start looking at it individual by individual. Yeah, great points, actually. And I mean, I, I can definitely relate, especially to the first one that you were saying. I mean, I, I, we often have a conversation within our leadership, which is the fact is we are all living in the age of personalization, right? When you go to Amazon, what you see is very different than what I see. When yeah. we go to Netflix, what you are you know, being recommended is very different. So obviously, mm -hmm. you know, we've got to adapt to the fact that, you know, it's not only the technology that we use, but even our workplace and, you know, the, what drives us is very, very different. So, yeah, absolutely. That's a great point. Yeah. And you're right. You know, Netflix knows us better than our significant other. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and yet we come into work and, uh, and the manager thinks that, you know, he or she should be able to treat us all the same. It, it's just, right. it's just not the 21st century uh, way to do it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I was curious about, you know, again, one of the things I think in your first answer, when you were mentioning this, it kind of struck to me and I wanted to come back to it, is uh, high performing teams. Uh, what have in your, the study and the research and the consultancy that you've seen, what are some attributes that contribute towards a high performing team in your opinion? That's a great question. There's, there's some that are, that are rather counterintuitive, if you will, because when we think of great teams, we think of those teams that everybody gets along and everybody is, is happy. And you're, yourself working in, in high tech, you know that's often not the case. In, in some really high performing teams, there is some conflict, but it's really positive conflict. People are arguing ideas out. And they're in what we call it, they leave the pillows at home. They come in and they're willing to have those, those tough arguments. Now, they never attack the person. They're attacking the idea and they're challenging the idea. And what we found as we started studying some of these great teams is the manager will set rules for debate, ground rules, if you will. You know, ideas like, look, we're going to use a piece of everybody's idea. We're going to uh, respect the person. We challenge the idea, but never the person. Different types of rules that they'll set in place. That was one of the big ahas we found in these great teams is they, they create psychological safety so that people feel safe to throw out even crazy ideas because it's typically the crazy idea that has that little nugget that, that will lead, you know, an organization to some really good results. Now, one of the other things we found, too, is that, um, is that engagement, as I mentioned before, in these great teams is very one on one. And yet they have a very strong, uh, in a way, they break down any sort of silos that exist by having a, just a real laser focus on their customer, who their customer is. Now, that may sound like an obvious thing. In fact, again, I don't think I've been into a company that doesn't believe customers, number one. And yet, as I talk to their employees, many times they'll tell us, I don't really know who my customer is. I'm in a manufacturing plant. Is my customer the end user or is it the middleman who sells my product? Is my customer the boss? Uh, we go into a hospital system. Uh, many times we will find the nurses, the lab techs, they think the customer is the doctor. If the doctor's happy, then, then we all should be happy. Not that person lying in the hospital bed or the, or the family surrounding them are all worried about them. There's some, sometimes there's a real confusion around who the customer is. Mm -hmm. um, in these great teams, there's a laser focus. We know who our customer is. We know what wowing means to our customer. Mm -hmm. And we know how to serve them in the best way possible. And also, there's, there's, no, um, there's no sort of sacred ideas around this. 
that if a customer in, is, needs to be served, that sometimes we're gonna break down that status quo to create disruption to really help serve them. Um, I'd be curious, um, especially given the last you know, seven, eight months and what all of us across the globe have been through, uh, what has been your observation working with, again, organizations and leaders um, and what leadership you know, qualities need, in, need to kind of come through much more in these kind of tough times? A few things is we've worked with um, a lot of organizations through over this last eight, nine months, as you say, the ones that are doing very well. Um, it comes from the top. The leadership at the top are extremely open to new ideas. In fact, one of our um, one of our companies it's a U.S. based uh, company, but they um, the CEO sixty thousand employees, and the CEO told me he says, uh, you know, when, when something like this happens, he says your um, your rural followers he says are pretty much paralyzed at this point. They don't know what to do. He says, but you've got crazies out there who are already trying things. He says, in your good, in good times, you, the crazies in many cases get pushed out of your organization. He says, those are you people you need to embrace in this time because they've got the ideas that will help you. And he says, so he says, I pick up the phone and I call my crazies and I listen to them. And he says, the ideas that he gained from them, he says, I start spreading around and we start trying these things out. You've got to be willing to try out new ideas. Now, his organization is a restaurant, um, a chain of 600 restaurants, 60,000 employees across the U.S. Um, restaurants, as you know, probably the same as happening in India as are happening around the world is, you know, tens of millions of employees have lost their jobs in restaurants. His restaurant, they started hiring. Um, it was just named by a U.S. Res restaurant Nations News as the number one restaurant uh, during this pandemic. They've wow. grown, their stock increased 112% over the last six months. It's a, it's a remarkable success story. Uh, I'm actually helping him uh, write, write the book of this story because it's just been so phenomenal. Wow. But what he found was, again, your, your people have ideas. Um, as he said at one point, he says, look, I don't have the ideas. He says, but together, we can be Albert Einstein. Together, we can be geniuses, but you've got to share those ideas. So you have to listen to some of your radicals during this tough time. So that was one thing I found. Another is just the increasing communication with those managers who are doing really well at this point. Um, another CEO we deal with is a guy named Gary Ridge, who, uh, who is CEO of the WD-40 company, you know, the, the stuff you spray on uh, to lubricate things. Um, so Gary, one thing he said is during these, this crisis, he said, I, I set a a goal to communicate with my team every single day. He says, I'll call my, my people up and I'll say, how are you doing today? Because he says, today is probably different than yesterday and the day before. And he says, the other thing he did with his team was he instituted a rule of no lying, no hiding conversations. Um, everything would be transparent. Even if it was kind of hard, we would be extremely transparent. And, and the last thing he did, which ties into our, our new book, Bleeding Gratitude, is that they upped their gratitude game because he says, in this time, you've got to show people the value that they're creating is important to you. So that's what gratitude's about. It's seeing and then rewarding those behaviors. One more question before I come to my last one. Uh, <laughs> obviously, you know, you, you also talked about... Uh, you know, agile organizations being trying to be agile and, you know, things are changing. The pace of change is just much faster today than it was five years ago. And it probably is going to be, you know, X times faster in a few years. Yeah. Um, so given that, generally, what kind of advice would you give employees in terms of you know trying to stay abreast and you know kind of not lose out, especially maybe you know folks who are in kind of their forties and fifties, uh, and the space of innovation and the change and the rapid change that's happening all around you all the time. 
You know, from, uh, we deal a lot with leaders, of course, helping leaders create these more agile cultures. But your question is interesting too, in that what, what do employees do? How do, how do we embrace change? Because uh, as, a, as an individual contributor, there is more risk in this. We have to be aware of that, that the change can create fear in an individual contributor. How will this affect my job? If I take a risk, am I really protected or not? And so this really is where it comes down to the leadership, creating a very safe environment um, that you have to be willing to let people take risks. Um, one manager I was talking to uh, not too long ago said, uh, he says, I reward employees when they tell me they've made a mistake. I give them a cash bonus. Uh, he says, why? He says, I don't want them to make mistakes, but I want them to be, to know that it's okay and to bring me the challenges because then we can fix them quickly. Um, it's just a different way of thinking about it. So as an employee, the thing is, you know, it's interesting as I go in and I do a lot of speeches. Well, I used to now and I'm doing a lot virtually, but as I would do speeches, um, in person, the CEO would take me aside beforehand and I would be going to an insurance company or a, a banking company, a oil and gas company. And they would say, look, I need you to talk to my people about taking risks. And I like, I'm, I, I'm, I'm sort of, you're in banking you're in oil and gas, you really want risk taking? And they said, yeah, yeah, we're way too stagnant. Our competitors are eating our lunch. There are new competitors coming in, uh, whether you know, with new technological solutions digitally, um, having in many cases, no offices, they're, they're operating at a much lower margin. Uh, we need to start disrupting. I need you to get my people to start taking risks. So what we find is that you know, leaders are looking for this. They're desperate for those people in their teams who will be willing to go out a little bit and say, let's try something new. We call these people the radicals. Um, they're not, it's, um, don't be confused with the person we might call the devil's advocate. That's just a negative person, you know? They're always looking for the negative. A radical is somebody who looks at things in a new way, who may bring ideas from the outside, who may sort of, you know, want to try something new and bubble up ideas. That's what organizations are looking for. And really, if you want to get ahead in your organization, you've got to be willing to take a little bit of a chance and, 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 and work within the, uh, within the box, but still create and, and take a few risks. Right. Got you. Okay, great. Uh, my last question, uh, let's say you were giving the commencement address for the, you know, the young graduates going out into the corporate world uh, through these times, uh, what, would, what would you say to them? Yeah, you know, especially for those in business, um, whether you're in working in technology or healthcare, banking, whatever you've been working in, you've probably been well-trained in the science of your, you know, accounting or, or human resources or whatever you do. Unfortunately, what we do very badly in school is teach you the human side. The business really is about relationships and it's about nurturing those, fostering those, and especially caring for those who, who, who you are charged to lead. And one day you will be given some responsibilities to, to lead people. Um, and this comes down to the idea, will you be aware of their individual issues, that they are each unique people who will be motivated in very different ways? And can you find ways to inspire them? Um, when you think of the greatest leaders in, in history, they typically emerge during the toughest times. Um, they, and now we are in the toughest times. We are looking for leadership. And that's what I would hope is that the young people coming in will realize, speak up, um, say what you need as an employee. And then when you become a leader yourself, really take care of those in your charge. That it really is about relationships. People will do much when they know that you care about them. Right. Phenomenal. Wow. That was, that was some great advice, not only for the new graduating class, but I think for everybody over here. And I'm sure the audience uh, has gained a lot, as have I. Uh, so I really wanted to thank you, Adrian, for taking the time, uh, sharing your insights with us. And, uh, you know, I, I'm positive that the audience is gain, going to gain a lot 
Thank so, you, Nayam. Thank Thanks, you. Appreciate yeah. it.